Okay. Well, councillors, I'd uh, like to declare the ordinary council meeting of the 25th of June 2020 uh, open. Uh, I can advise you that the meeting is being live streamed, and uh, I'd invite Paul uh, to do the opening karaoke. I'm here, no tato. Matu matu e tirangi, ok pangi e matu o matu tui. Arahina mai e ia matu korero i te hura he tika ki te ingo te matu o tama te waro o tapu. Amen. Move on to item two on the agenda, which is the apologies. Uh, do we have any apologies? So is Francois online? Uh, there being no apologies, we move on to item number three, which is the declarations of interest. Uh, the document is on team systems, and it's also on the table here as well. Uh, if you have a conflict, even if you think it's a possibility, uh, right on the side of being cautious. We move on to item four on the agenda. And that's uh, urgent items uh, not on the agenda. As far as I'm aware, there are none. Any councillors aware of anything? That... Okay. Move on to item five on the agenda, which is the minutes of the 28th of May, 2020 uh, council meeting. Now they've been distributed via team systems to all councillors. There have been, there's no feedback that we've received that any change is required. Uh, has that changed? Is there any, anybody around the table that has noticed? Okay. Would someone like to move that the minutes of the council me meeting held on the 28th of May 2020 be confirmed as a true and correct record of the meeting? So, Deputy Mayor Carruthers, a second that. Councillor Martin, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Okay. Now, for those on Zoom, if you could raise your hand during the voting process so I, I can pick up on it. Okay. Move on to the minutes of the 16th of June, 2020, the extraordinary meeting. The minutes were separately uh, were circulated separately. Uh, there are some minor changes, which uh, uh, Diane has done. Uh, and uh, do you want me to run through those, Diane? Or are you Quite happy to do that. I can run through. Would you, would you run through the list? Um, so just on the first page, Councillor Hutch will attend the meeting from 9.15am due to connectivity issues. Um, it's, um, it's in relation to DWC Western Sports Hub funding, um, Councillor Davidson remained in the meeting and the declaration of interest was being um, involved as part of the user group of the facility for the DWC and Sports Hub. That just needs to be added in. And item number 22, uh, Laser Park. Um, just to note that Councillor Martin actually left the meeting. And Councillor Cogan noted a conflict as being part of the Three Mile Reserve Committee. And then Councillor Martin returned to the meeting. So. Most of the only members. Thanks for that, Diane. And uh, that's uh, when councillors, when you declare an interest, if you could just advise what it is so that Diane can record it. Uh, now, looking for someone to move that the minutes of the extraordinary council meeting held on the 16th of June 2020 with the minor amendments made by the Minute Secretary be confirmed as a true and correct record of the meeting. So I'd like to move that. Move to Councillor Cogan. I have a second that. Councillor Davidson, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion's carried. Move on to item six on the agenda, which is the action list. And councillors, it's on pages five and six of your agenda. 
and I'll ask the Chief, Chief Executive to run us through. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, councillors. I'll run through one by one. Canary Students Cycle Trail, we are, are still well waiting for pricing. We talked to the consultants only yesterday, and it's still on the on the back work of their program. So hopefully it's not too far away from getting across the line. Uh, speed limits, um, this was going to be conducted after the annual plan process, so we'll get that into process shortly. I know it has taken some time, but we have identified the full list of speed um, changes we would like on the local roads. And um, then it obviously goes out for public consultation. Uh, transfer of pension housing to Destination Westland. Uh, in discussion with the uh, CE of Destination Westland, they have um, got another consultant um, proposal in front of them and uh, comparing the two at the moment. So hopefully that will go out for um, work very shortly in line with the long-term plan process. Cass Square, that's on hold and uh, working, uh, working through that as part of the CDC uh, committee, um, which will be meeting shortly. Uh, this is also tied in obviously closely with the race course development op options, or master planning options as well. Sorry, Dave, you, can you put yourself on mute, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Carnegie Building Project. Um, we have had uh, a decline from lotteries and we are still awaiting the final outcome of our funding application for Cultural and Heritage Fund. It hasn't come through yet in terms of an outcome of that. Fox Landfall, the Golders report has been completed. Uh, GM of District Assets and the Operations Manager had a conversation with uh, Minister of Environment and Golders last week in terms of a way forward. And all are in agreement that um, Fox Landfall is not recyclable. Uh, it has to be relocated. So working through the process of how that will actually eventuate. The, uh, we have got an application then for the um, PGF to do that work. Um, and we are hopeful that that will get approved. Talking to Penny Bicknell um, this morning, um, that still hasn't been uh, decided, and it, but it has gone to Cabinet, so it is um, imminent. Um, so hopefully we'll hear that with that shortly. And iwi representation around the council table. Um, we have had responses from DIA. Um, through your worship, we probably have to confirm what those next steps actually are. Um, that's uh, my update on the action list. Thanks, uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, Councillors um, around the table. Uh, Paul. Oh, Councillor Martin. Uh, kia ora, thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks for the update, uh, Simon. Um, just on iwi representation, I wonder if it wouldn't be appropriate as part of next year's remit process for LGNZ that we consider using that as a vehicle to advance this. Um, we, councils would have seen the remit list circulated by the Chief Executive recently in terms of how local government as an organisation can put forward proposals to the Minister or to the appropriate organisation, and that is a potential mechanism that I've, I've only just thought about as I was hearing you speak, Simon. So, I mean, that would be eight months away yeah. from being able to be advanced, but potential there. Um, be interesting to um, see um, just on the speed limits, um, are you proposing that come to the July council meeting? Um, we'll have to consult, confirm. Um, July or August. Oh, okay. August, yeah. Yep. July or August. I think July might be a bit tight in terms of coming through. I just wonder with the um, the completion date target dates then whether that they should potentially be revised um, yeah. around the action list, April, June, May, for example. Um, that would be my only comment, Your Worship. And thank you for your responses, Simon. 
Thanks, uh, Councillor Martin. I'm sure the uh, after that magnificent presentation that the Canary school children gave us in relation to uh, their project, uh, the update will be welcomed by them. Councillor Hart. And I thanks for the report. Nothing from me. Councillor Davis. No, nothing from me. Councillor Hart. Sorry, Councillor Neil. Um, yep, certainly looking forward to the speed limit um, being filed and progressed further. And yes, do we decide now if that's the best way to go with the EWI representation? Nathan, do you think? Or any further thoughts on that? Should be keen to see it progress. Just to your worship, I'll take some advice on that externally. Um, there's obviously a number of players in, in this place, um, mm -hmm. particularly central government, which will have the majority of the um, influence. We have DIA on today, which potentially we could actually ask them on a way forward. It's mm -hmm. an excellent suggestion. Okay. Councillor Hutchell. No, nothing to add, Your Worship. Thanks for that. I'm uh, oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Um, someone would like to. Uh, Your Worship. Oh, of course. <laughs> Councillor Kennedy. Uh, no, uh, nothing, thank you. And uh, Councillor Cogan. Uh, no, the only thing, um, of course, that I just want to um, bring up, um, thanks for the report, Simon, just is that we continue to proceed with looking into those strategies around the pensioner housing um, through Destination Westland. I know with all the changes going on, I just don't want to see that slip off the board anywhere. Through your worship. So I have had discussions with... Um, Obviously, Joe and Conway, and it is one of their highest priorities is to make sure that, that process is completed well in time for the long term plan process. Yep, great. Thank you. Um, invite uh, the councillor to resolve that the updated action must be received, uh, and there are no items to be removed. Um, so I'd like to move. Um, we should uh, recommend that we remove CAS Square as an ongoing action. Um, this is actually taken up by the Community Development Committee going forward. Okay. Would uh, someone like to move that the action list, the updated action list with CAS Square removed, be received? And uh, I'd like to move that, maybe. Councillor Davidson, to Councillor Hartrell, all those in favour, please. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Move on to the presentations, and uh, the first presentation is with NZTA. A big welcome to Colin and Moira. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming along. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor, for coming uh, along the meeting. It's good to be able to come and meet you face to face and uh, just get an update on what's happening. Now, we've got, um, we've got Peter Connors, who is um, our system management lead in, in the Christchurch office. I'm not sure if he's going, he was going to try and zoom in, but I'm just not, not sure if he was going to be able to make it or not. So, Hi, I'm here. I'm here, Colin, if you can hear okay. me. Yeah, we can hear you. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Yeah, we can see a little symbol on the, on the screen here. Um, so, um, Pete, Pete will be available to answer any help answer any questions at the end. Um, and we've also got Moira here. Moira's our network contract manager, so she looks after all the um, maintenance issues um, for us and, and drives the maintenance contract. So if there are any um, issues that are specific to what she does, then she'll be um, happy to answer those as well. So what I want to do today is just focus on um, mainly um, what the risks on the network are. I think there's been a question raised about what we're doing around certain sites um, in, in Westland and uh, just where this sits in our programming works and what we're doing to try and mitigate those risks. So I want to run through those items and also just talk a little bit about what NZTA's plan for resilience, or uh, treatment resilience is and you know, how, we, how we manage that process. Um, so we'll just run through it. There'll be, there'll be, there'll be time for questions at the end. If there's anything you want to um, ask about or you think that uh, has, been, has been covered adequately. So just by way of a, a personal introduction, um, I, I've been with the agency um, for 30 years now. I'll go back a long way. And um, I've, I've seen 
I've seen now uh, all the changes that happened through um, Land Transport New Zealand, Transit New Zealand when we came in. Uh, I had a short stint at the skirt working at, uh, on a crossroads rebuild and then you came back and uh, took over the West Coast. So I've been doing this job on the coast for about four years now, so still learning. There's a lot, a lot to um, take in. And there's certainly a lot of um, issues out there in the network that um, take a bit of getting my head around, but we're getting there. So um, in that time, there's been some really um, significant events. First of all, uh, we had Cyclone Fahey and Gita, um, and the damage that that caused right up and down the whole length of the coast, really from Pernikaiki right down to Gates of Past. And in fact, some of those sites we'll talk about later are still actually um, repairing them. Um, in November 2018, we had a significant event in the Matera region, which dealt out a lot of damage um, through the end, close to a couple of bridges, and we're still doing repairs in there as well. And it seems to be a bit of a pattern in that we get work going and we don't get it finished before the next event comes in. Um, last December, we had the uh, heavy rainfall event um, around Hercules um, area, Fox, in the Fox Hills. And again, we're still repairing that. And those of you who drive down there will see the work that's going on down there. Um, so, yeah, resilience is a, is a really big issue for us. And um, I'll just run through some of the sites that, that um, we see as our, our highest risk items. And uh, we'll just deal with them one by one. Perhaps if you've got any questions about what we're doing in any, any of those sites, you can just um, you know, deal with it as we go. Right, so here's the list, um, basically running from uh, south to north. Uh, we've got Diana Falls, which is an ongoing um, project for us now. Um, this is where, unfortunately, we lost some tourists off the road. They were swept down the river, and um, we had to uh, undertake some really major repairs uh, up above the highway at Diana Falls, and we're getting... Uh, we've got quite a large budget for ongoing damage at um, that site. It's all netted and fenced, and there's big barriers up above the road that you can't see that uh, do get damaged uh, after a significant weather event. So we've got quite a significant sum budget for every year to maintain that. Um, Gates of Pass, I've got some photographs of these sites, so we'll just run through the list. Gates of Pass. Um, so that's really from what we call the Hinge, which is at the bridge um, down the Thunder Falls. Um, Epitaph, uh, everyone will know that site well at Mike's Point. Bruce Bay, uh, where we have ongoing issues with, um, with um, sea surges coming across the road. Omara, we've got a slip there. Waiho River, which everyone here will know very well what's going on down there. Uh, Mount Hercules, we were working there. The deep, what we call the deviation, which is the uh, Wadara River, and we're accused around it meets the hill on the north side of the river, uh, on the north side of the bridge, uh, and Rotary Gorge as well. So, if we just run through some pictures of these. So, this is Diana Falls. Um, this, the picture on the left is looking to the north, I guess, uh, one good word. So, we've got a significant um, Barrier system up here, which is shown on the right. We've got these big posts that, that hold nets up that catch all the boulders that um, break loose and can head for the road. And they're reporting that system, and that's where we do a lot of our repairs every year. So that's that's monitored after every event, it's inspected, and probably at least once a year, we've got a team that will go up here and take repairs. Gates of Harst. Um, Bottom right picture is the repair work we've got underway there now. Um, during Fahey, there was some significant scouring in the riverbed there um, against this, what we call the true, be the true right bank. As you're looking at that picture, it's under that wall that we're constructing on the left here. So that, all, that, that was all scared out quite significantly to the point where the road started slumping. And, uh, the road there was well above the, the river. So, um, it presented a major challenge for us, and uh, work's all been, um, it's been un undertaken by MBD in there, um, putting a rock and concrete wall in there, and building it right back up the road again. They're probably about two thirds of the way through that work, so it's 
still another six months or so to go on there. So it's a multi, multi million dollar piece of work, very challenging environment for the guys to be working in, but they're getting through it, doing a great job. But we'll finish that and then um, we've got areas up towards the bridge and above the bridge to look at next. So it's just an ongoing piece of work and um, every major event there causes a little bit more damage because it's a bit more concerned, but hopefully we've got it under control and, and uh, we can mitigate the risks there. Um, Ebitar slip, uh, which you will all know well, it just um, basically came out of the middle of nowhere one night and um, um, there's some fear that this could be an ongoing issue. Um, we've got a significant monitoring process in there now and uh, it's, it's checked regularly for movement. And around about two years ago, we did some extensive drainage drilling up above the slip to try and um, stop the water getting down into in the soil layers, uh, soil layers below the slip and stabilise it, and that seems to be working really effectively. We've had no, no more movement since that's, that work's been done. And uh, if you drive past here, you'll see the pipes sticking out of the bank, and uh, you'll see a bit of water dripping out of those. So we're confident that we've, we've got it under control. Um, we don't know for sure. Um, it's very much dependent on what sort of weather events we get in that particular area. Um, it's nothing to say that um, it hasn't stopped moving, but we feel we've got it under control now. And we do have a, a, um, uh, a backup plan if, if there is some more movement there. Hopefully, we can just build up from what's left after we've had, had it inspected. Um, we, we, yeah, we, it's, a, it's a way to see game, really, but um, we, as I said, we can't really put it under control at the moment. Um, Peter Connors, would you mind muting your uh, camera, please? Or muting your sound. Everyone. Yeah, if, if you're if you've zoomed in, could you please ensure that you are muted? Thank you very much. Sorry, Bob. Okay, right. So that, that, that's it. Tough. Before moving on, yeah. what, what is plan B? Plan, so plan B, if, if we do get a failure, then um, we'll just throw a lot of gear at it and uh, get it open as quickly as we possibly can. We think probably four to seven days would be a realistic time frame, um, depending on what we're left with. Less if it, if, if it just slumps a little bit, we'll just build up from um, uh, what, whatever we're left with. But um, if it is a major piece of work, then um, yeah, we'll say four to seven days. That's what we're, we're putting our hopes on. Okay. So you don't envision having to reroute the road further back? Yes, we want. You want? Well, as I said, it depends if it just drops and it's, it's deemed to be structurally adequate, there's enough, enough strength in that slip to build up to the top again and do that. But it's very much a wait and see. Rerouting it further back, wouldn't that require quite a lot of planning oh, and consent? So, can some of that be planned for before it happens? There, there has been some, excuse me, sorry, there has been some quite significant um, investigation and research done on alternative alignments significantly back from the existing road. Um, the reality is, although it might not appear so, it's actually in the best place um, to go further inland and get into some pretty gnarly country for, for want of a better way to describe it, and, um, and you won't actually be any better off. So, uh, as the, although um, what we're doing now is the, the most uh, appropriate way to, to appropriate place for the road and appropriate way to manage it. Um, yeah, so just, wait, sorry, I'm just just on that. Is there other um, routes uh, within that uh, area at all, like inland? Pack tracks. Well, how far inland do you want to go? I mean, like. Uh, no, is is there is there an um, old uh, tracks? I, I I don't know, but I don't believe so. No, I don't believe so. Either. Pete, Pete, you might have a comment on that. You're more familiar with that particular area. Well, yeah, obviously the um, yeah. there, there, can you hear me, guys? Yeah. 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 Okay. So there is there is obviously a route that was looked at inland, but it's right on the um, Alpine fault line. So it was that was the choice to go to to sidle round Knights Point rather than go on that um, 
on that fault line track, which, you know, um, that's that was the decision at the time. I think it was the right decision. And obviously the problem that we've got, why we want to stay on the same bench is we actually looked at cutting into the hillside, but it was just from a geotechnical point of view, we could have the whole hillside down on it as and running for years. So this is the best long term, long, you know, medium term option that we've got, and uh, just to stay on, stay on the same bench, basically. Yeah, Peter, it's Ian Hartshorn. Um, I spoke to you at the RTC meeting, um, and we talked about that. And just, but just looking at the picture there, the from where the road is to the height to, you know, move back six, eight, ten metres, it looks pretty insignificant amount of volume and, and height that you'd have to do just to create a, uh, a bypass ready in case it does slip. And, and at the same time, it'd be taking a bit of weight off the top of the slip. Um, you're not no, looking... no that's, that, that's not the case. If you go in six to eight metres, you are, you're into it. You're into a cut. You're into a significant cut. Yeah, you'll be in, yes, yes, you'll yeah, be we in cut, But um, like there's big cuts all around the country. Um, what are you going to do if it slips and uh, it slips greater than you think? You, you're going to be into a cut straight away, aren't you? No. Well, no. We, we don't think. We don't believe we are. We'll believe. Like what's going to happen? What you've got going on at the toe? You've got you've got side cast. What you've got going on here is. In the old days, all the all the guys built the road. They they benched the road and they sidecast it. So that's that's the reality of what you're seeing going on. You've got sea erosion going on. It's it's taking away the tow, and it's and we had one big rush of material, which was a lot of sidecast material. Now, sure, we 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 accept we accept that if the tow erosion keeps going, that whole that whole bench could 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 slip again but we think we believe we can build back up on that existing bench rather than cutting in to the hillside which it's, if anybody if any of you has been around and I've been around when the, the past um, opened it got closed pretty regularly because of uh, you did, it, the, the, it, because of the slipping that went on and I know there's modern technologies today with rock but, you know, rock anchors and everything else. But it just, we've had a look at it. We've been through it with our geotech people. We've workshopped it. And it's just not the right thing to do there. Okay, we'll move on. Oh, sorry, just um, just one question. Uh, you, you said four to seven days if it slips. Uh, how do you come up with that figure? Okay, so that, that's really based on um, similar types of work that we've, we've undertaken in the past. We know what equipment we can get there. We can effectively work at it from both sides. If it does go, we can plant people on both sides. So, um, yeah, I mean, it is a thumbs up, but we're, we're pretty confident that that's what we'll be looking at. Can I ask if, you've, um, if you're planning to meet with the Haas community to update them on... No, no, we've had, we haven't had a, a request from them for a, for a meeting about this specific thing, but we're happy to talk to them if, if they want. Yes, because there is, of course, a lot of anxiety and yeah, asked about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, to stand on top of that slip mm. um, and to look down is very frightening. Yeah. It's not a place that you've got vertigo. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, we're, we're well aware of the, the economic impact on the, on the west coast if we lose the highway and you know this figure is thrown around we think it's probably in the region of three million dollars a day lost to the west coast if, if um, that does if that route does close mm -hmm. so we're very very focused on trying to keep it open and um, th this is just one challenge in that in that whole route and this is the, the point of this list um, just shows shows you how vulnerable that whole route is and where we're working and, and why we're working to try and keep it open so Bruce Bay is our next next site. So this was um, the photo on the left is after Cyclone Fahey, and it's fair to say that any any 
storm surge we get now leaves us with the same sort of debris on the road. So it is a real a real problem for us. Um, it's easy enough to clean up, but long term it's not it's not a solution to have to go back there all the time and, and keep trying to deal with it. So we have um, we have got a bit of work. Um, which is just starting off now. We've, we've already been there and done a bit. We've had to divert the crew away to, you know, to deal with Mount Hercules and the Fox Hills, but, but they're back there uh, next week, I think, more. So we'll, we're going to uh, be reinforcing that rock wall along there and um, trying to keep the, the sea away from the road. So that's a plan. There's a lot of fine material in the existing rock work that's here, and that's what's being thrown up on the road. So the idea is just to try and um, build it up and just stop that, that happening, build it up a little bit higher and also make it a little bit more um, rigid, I guess, in structure so the material doesn't get thrown up on the road. Scott, what sort of height are you anticipating? It it, it, it's only going to be um, about half a metre higher than it is now. It won't be, won't be great deal. So if we do get a particularly bad storm surge, then we probably will still, still end up the debris across the road, but it won't hopefully damage the structure of that rock face at all. That's what we're aiming for. At one stage, I understand you were talking about raising the height we're, of the road. Yeah, yeah. It's, we're, it's basically an, an, um, the, the real issue, that, and it's not only for this site, but up and down the west coast is getting good rock to do this sort of work. And we haven't got a source of rock close close by um, this, this site. We've got Paringa, um, which is reasonably close, but it's not good good enough quality rock to um, build the whole thing out of it. So we're going to have to import a bit of rock from other places. So um, it's, it just makes it an, it makes it an, an incredibly expensive um, job for that length of road. So uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a, what do you call it? Um, it's a resilient enough option, I guess, for a few weeks. Has any thought been given to um, building a training wall at the mouth of the Mahitake River? Uh, it's a different, so that's, so that's further south. No. Well, no. I'm, I'm marginal. No, 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 we haven't. No. I mean, I'm no, no engineer, but um, I know in the past it's been, um, it was raised that that was the cause of the erosion because the, the Mahito River yeah. swung around to the north and still runs parallel to the road, basically, in, in parts. In, we, and that's what's causing the sea to to gouge into the road. Yeah, but if, if there's a training wall at the front, at, at the mouth of the river, it would send the river straight out. We did get an opinion from our coastal engineers about that, and they didn't think that that would influence the, the erosion yeah, at all. So. I'd like to see a second opinion on that. Because I've heard that before from, um, uh, from coastal engineers in the past. Well, that, yeah. that was an answer. I, I can't remember the details now, but from, from what I remember, the, the comment was that the, um, the coastal drift is northwards there, so any, any material that comes out of the, the river will end up replenishing the coast, not taking material away from it. So, so yeah, they weren't confident that that would, that would be a solution. I think we can, we'll can. we be happy to share the report. Share that report, Colin. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we've got a report on that. I know back in the 1980s, early 1990s, that was the talk at the time. Um, and it was a, at the time when Jeremy Gibbs was doing surveys at here to take a ticket. I mean, co coastal erosion is a problem for us right now. We've got several sites, and, you know, including North Braymount. So it's just the sea's constantly attacking the, the um, seafront there where we've got the road. So I mean, the roads between the highway and, and, the, and the, you know, the highways between the, the seafront and the adjacent land, we've got problems. So it's, um, yeah, we're just trying to keep up with it. Really. In a lot of cases, that, you know, retreating isn't isn't an option. We can't go further in there. Um, so the next site is just um, in, in Omaroa, the Fox Hills. This again was a, a site damaged in, in Cyclone Fahey and we've still got to complete repairs here. We have a design for it but we've got to actually repair it. So it's down, it's effectively um, one lane at the moment so it's priority of waiting. But, um, we haven't forgotten about it. 
Um, Waiho River, yeah. Um, what can I say about this? Uh, so the bridge has been in place, as you will be well aware, and um, there's been ongoing reinforcement of the stop banks um, in, in there. Uh, we've just completed building up the stop bank by about another metre on the south side, and we still have a little bit of work to do to the southern approach here and uh, a little bit more reinforcement to do that and then we'll be finished again. So uh, that, that'll be um, everything uh, from us for now. But uh, we'll, I think we'd, we'd like you awaiting the outcome of the project that's put to yep. the growth uh, fund. So we'll, we'll deal with that when, when we know what the outcome of that is, I suppose. So, but for the time being, we're confident that the, um, it's a, a good, resilient um, solution for that here. So, uh, but again, we will continue to monitor it, and um, there's always an ongoing bit of work there to keep an eye on um, what's eroding, where we need to reinforce it, and um, it's just a, one of the other troubling sites we've got. Just, just um, through yeah. the chair. Um, while we're talking about that, is a couple of things. Um, just up the valley, I know you've done quite a bit of work up here at uh, Slippery Face area. Um, just myself and, and other people have said to me uh, the same thing without even mentioning it to them. Uh, on the bend there at Slippery Face, the rock was put in and then they put another layer of rock in, and that's great. It's a very flat amber, and um, we've been told by NZTA several times as a friends community the super coming around the corners. Um, when you look at it, the rock stops probably a metre or so below the Tarsil Road. Yeah, so that, so that um, we only look after the highway here, we don't look after the glacier access road at all. Um, it's only the, it's managed by dock. Yes, okay, that's, that's fine, but I thought the rock would have been brought up to protect the road because I can see quite easily in a good flood I might have to be a real good one. There'll be gravel come around down there, and that super will come down around that corner and go straight up and take the top off the road. Yeah, I, I believe Doc are aware of that, and they've been talking to the consultants. Now, the interesting thing is that um, Doc uh, is looking at um, um, handing over the responsibility of managing that road to, to us and NZTA. So, just what that will mean long term for that bit of work and for us. So if that management was taken out, would you look at Priority Rock on top of that? Well, just because we manage it doesn't mean to say we pay for it. Um, Doc, Doc will still be responsible for funding any work that's, that's done there, so it really comes down to what they can afford to do and what risk they're prepared to accept for the for the for that road. So it's easy to uh, really pointed it out to Doc, so no, 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 yeah, they're aware of it, yeah. Okay. Um, other thing, just uh, with the YO, um, I know there's, you know, with the funding, they've put in for funding for the 20 million to build the walls and everything like that. You know, we would like all these authorities to work together. Now, is the NZTA sort of working together on that as, as a plan, as it towards the highway as protection as well? Yes, we are. We're, we're, well, we're in constant discussion with um, my council staff here and, and with the regional council and with the DOC. So it's a, there's a multi party approach to So the, the whole plan includes what the yeah. might, might do with the highway or the yeah. bridge or anything like future proving. Yeah, we, we are aware that if, if the solution uh, that's decided on is to raise the banks even higher than we have to raise the bridge higher, that would be. Yeah, that'll be one of our uh, inputs into that project. Probably one other point I'd like to bring up here is um, NZTA have just gone and raised the south side salt bank considerably and in the past, and there's definitely no consultation with the business community of Franz Joseph. Now, the, the Franz Joseph uh, rating district has been trying to extend the stock bank for several years. And we've had meetings in the frames, and the first thing we get told is a rating district trying to protect our whole town is that NZTA will object. So, 
are you saying we're not in a, the, the town is not an affected party to what you're doing on the other side? Well, NZTA's responsibility is to protect the highway. So any, so, any, any work we, we do will be to protect the highway. It won't be anything more than that. That's fine. So is NZTA going to stop opposing the, what the town for, wants to do? Is he going to stop that? Um, we, 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 we need to get some common ground here to make the thing move forward. And hopefully this $20 million actually solves that problem. Yeah, we haven't. So to my knowledge, we haven't um, written or have anything reported in the way of an opposition to that to that project. We have, our position is we're, we're wait and see. So yeah. we'll, we'll we'll deal with whatever um, you know, long term solution the town and the government and council and, and the regional council decide. So what happens if we don't get the twenty million funding? What, what happens if um, you know because we're up meetings and all minute that you know trains are the pose, trains are the pose. So we just need to get on some common ground here somewhere in the future. I think uh, Councillor Hunter, I can uh, I can clarify part of it in that uh, the the um, Department of Conservation, NCTA being really helpful, um, regional council, the the group that's put the application in they're using uh, um, West Coast Regional Council is completely united. I think what you're talking about <coughs> is what happens if it doesn't happen. Yes. And the question is to whether NTTA will oppose North Side raising its 45 metres. That mean, that's what we're doing, yeah. That's <coughs> leading into the swap deed into it, but uh, we just get this. Yeah, what's NTTA's position on that? Basically, we can't raise our stock bank for. Yeah, the, the position we're in now is that the, the south side of the stop being that, that is protecting the highway there is about as high as we can make it go. Um, if we start trying to make any higher, then um, we're going to have to increase the width of it, um, and it just becomes a hugely expensive op operation. So, yeah, and, and, and realistically, it's, it's one that we couldn't afford to do. So. You know, um, I appreciate that. I'm not actually talking about the south side, I'm talking about the north, north side of predicting the town. Yeah. So, can I? Um, so, I think what it comes down to is, is uh, our support or otherwise of any application is based on sound engineering uh, advice, and, and we, we act on the advice of our engineers in consultation with. Um, the regional council and what their engineers are saying and stuff like that. And so I, I, from what I know about what's happened uh, on the north side of the Waiho River or the Waiho River uh, in, in the whole, is, is we're acting uh, uh, based on the advice of our engineers and, and in accordance uh, or in agreement with the regional council. It's probably not for this meeting, it's probably a bigger discussion, but um, yeah, we'll talk about engineers. <coughs> Um, through your worship, leaving aside the, the issue of the, um, the stock funds, um, and hopefully that $20 million will, will come through. Um, but I think it's time for the, the uh, there was perhaps the council started to lobby the government to re um, permanent, replace a permanent bridge across the Wai I mean, it's 30 years since the um, suspension bridge was removed, and we've had Bailey bridges ever since. And I can remember they've lifted it at least three, four times. Yeah, um, twice. Twice. Oh, okay. There's, um, it, in the 1980s, it was lifted, and then they first, had not long taken out the, wire, the the suspension bridge, and then they lifted it, and then they lifted it again. Yeah, it was um, twice. So we had the suspension bridge, which was removed in 1990, I think, and then we've raised the um, Bailey, and then it's been raised twice. Yes, and so you are going to be continually faced with that. Um, but um, what I don't understand is, and this is not in a criticism of NZTA, it's of the government, why the government doesn't replace a permanent bridge there. Colin, Colin, yeah. here. I'm, happy, I'm happy to answer that. The, um, the, the Bailey Bridge is, is, is actually the best um, short to medium term option. We've yeah we've got we've got uh, we've got 
issues about where we actually finally, finally put a bridge site. We've got issues about height. We've got so many uncertainties there. It's the it would be it would be amongst the most volatile riverbeds in New Zealand, and I don't I, I don't believe it would matter where we were. Um, it would still probably be a bailey, and um, except you know maybe in a, um, a higher volume area, it'd be two baileys. So you got uh, either side. But the reality the reality of life is. In terms of managing under those river conditions, the Bailey Bridge is our best short to medium term option. Hmm. Thanks, Ben. Okay. Looking forward for a long term option, which would be a permanent bridge. What, what happened, Glass, to the um, plan, um, which was to um, reroute the highway off the south end of the bridge um, and through the bush and around to the toe of the Fox Hill? Is that off the uh, that, that's sitting in abeyance, so we'll just wait to see what the what the long term um, outcomes are. What what is funded through the provincial growth fund? Um, it all comes down to that. So. But as I said before, we're basically at the point now where we've raised the stop banks as high as we go. So if the river continues to come up, then um, we need to be starting to look at somewhere else to put the, the highway. Through the chair, um, thank you for um, the discussion so far. Uh, surely, outside of PGF, though, there must be some work plan around work for um, Franz Joseph Whitehall area and the bridge. You know, is there does NZTA, uh, NZTA sorry have a, a ranking system for urgent and critical infrastructure in terms of actually running as an organisation? Because the reliance on PGF is a is a issue at the moment. But long term, where does the replacement of this bridge and the associated works actually sit in terms of day to day advice and, and liaison with the government outside of PGF? So we don't we don't we don't have reliance on, on the PGF funding. We'll we'll um, you know react to it if it, if it is approved. We'll we'll work in with that project. But at the moment, our, our long term plan is basically to defend the bridge where it is. Um, until it's no longer possible, and then we'll start looking at um, other solutions. But um, like I said right at the beginning, we recognise what the um, criticality of this route is, and, and we'll, we'll certainly do everything we possibly can to ensure that it stays a viable route. So. And, and just, just furthermore, the, the solution here is not just a, a transport solution. It's a solution for everybody. It's, we, we're part of that. There's been so many reports written about this river. Um, we, you know, it, it would be The agency just can't go and do a transport solution by itself. It's the solution for the whole, the, the whole infrastructure, the infrastructure of Franz Joseph. It's the farmland, the surrounding farmland. It's just not a, a transport solution. It's a solution for every every asset that's sitting there. Mm. I guess that was, thank you, Peter. That was part of my question as terms of where does that sit in terms of your work stream and work plans to be part of that? Through, it, through the chair. So if you recall, councillors, last year, Dave Brash was contracted by government to do an A report uh, he's completed that report and it's actually now with ministers, or he actually presented that to ministers before Christmas last year, and it's still with ministers at the moment. It's clear as mud, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on to the next side. Oops. <laughs> so, uh, River. So this is um, an area that we, we call the deviation, which is sort of the major deviation. Point where the river deviates, I guess, mm. why it's called that. It actually looks quite a bit different to that now. That channel that is on the left, left is basically full now, and the mm. river is um, flowing to the right side of that, that, um, and that channel to the right. So, um, But we have got challenges here because um, when it does flood, it goes almost to the top of that stonework, and um, again, we've got the road, we've got an issue with the road slumping there, we're going to have to go back and um, try and repair some of the damage to that rock facing and, um, and try and support the road, um, prop the road up, up again. We've also got issues at the Waterway Bridge at the moment that uh, for anyone that's driven over in the last couple of weeks, you might have noticed there's been a bit of a change um, 
certainly the south end, the bridge, so we've got some repair work um, to do there as well. So just an ongoing piece of work, um, something that we just continue to keep an eye on. Um, Mount Hercules, it look, looks a lot different to the distance this photo, photograph is taken, um, and that work is coming on really well, but again, it, it is a particularly challenging site. Um, there's a lot of material up in the gullies, um, a lot of tree, um, dead trees and um, slip sites are up there that um, tend to get washed down to the road when, when we get a major event up there. So it's an ongoing challenge to, to try and keep this bit of road in good condition as well and keep it open. So how long has that project got to go? Probably only a couple of months. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. um, so we're, we're pretty hopeful the bulk of it will be finished. We're just a little bit hamstrung by winter, so pretty hopeful that we'll have the bulk of it finished by October, so it's sealed in and everything. We're really just sort of waiting for the appropriate weather conditions. Right, and now we're on State Highway 73, so we have got major issues at Kelly's Creek, at, at, uh, so this is just um, on the side of Rotera Township. Um, there's a lot of material washing down uh, the river there, and it's got to the point where we can't, we've run out of places to put all the gravel, and uh, just pushing it into the Rotera River isn't, isn't a solution, so we're actually uh, thinking about um, possibly having a build of bridge there at a higher level that might be the best long term plan for that. So in the very early stages we're looking at a, um, a route that we can put a, a new bridge on but um, yeah, it's just another one of those ongoing issues for us. And the last site is the Otero Gorge. Um, we've got some work happening that, that these photo, photographs, the well, one photograph on the left was taken during the December 2000, sorry, the uh, November 2018 event, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so that's all repaired now, but we have still got a bit of a problem further, further up the gorge at um, Candy's Bend where uh, the river scours and um, protection works we've got um, well down the river that you can't actually see from the road, so we've got to go back there and do some repairs for that, they'll finish that side off. And I think that's them all. So um, those are all the those are the sort of the highest risk items I, I guess for using the district the ones that uh, basically keep us awake at night. Um, in terms of our NTTA's approach to the city overall, we've got a, a team that are specifically focused on resilience issues in the country. And they're basically working through um, a program of works and doing some policy around um, dealing with resilience, fund, fund, making sure we've got sufficient funding to deal with it. Um, just on that slide here, you can see the, the issues that we've got are that um, we've got ageing assets, and this is particularly true on the west coast, but there's still a lot of uh, old bridges. Um, the road is still pretty much in its original structure since it was, since it was built. Um, it's been resealed and there's been a few bits of widening added to it, but basically it's still the same road, the same materials that mm -hmm. uh, are in place that was built back in the 60s. So it's getting to be a very old road now. It's still fit for purpose pretty much, but um, there are some challenges in terms of keeping it in good condition. Um, our assets are more exposed, particularly to um, uh, coastal, coastal type events and, and weather events. Um, and that doesn't seem to be going away. We're getting more and more of it. We seem to be getting more and more of those events nowadays. And like I said before, we, we barely get the chance to um, clean up for one of them before we've got the next one to deal with that. So um, that is a challenge for us. And on top of that, this increasing expectations. Um, people seem to want a, a, a higher level of service all the time. Um, we've got challenges in terms of tourism down the coast and, and You'll be well aware of um, what issues that, that brings with it in terms of providing facilities for them. Um, just as, as an example, um, we're finding now that a lot of the small pull-off areas that, that are up and down the highway, particularly if it's an, an attraction, um, are now just being overwhelmed by visitors and um, we get traffic stacking out on the road and parking down the side of the highway. And that 
creates um, you know, a lot of safety issues as well. So the, the, it's a matter of being able to react to all those as they're, as they're evolving as well. So it's an ongoing challenge. Um, we, a couple of years ago, there were a number of corridor management plans that were put together, and these do touch on the resilience of these routes. For the West Coast, there are two corridor management plans, and they're available online. You can actually access them from the NZTA website. Um, one of the corridor routes is this one here, the Nelson to Wanaka one, um, and there's also another one which starts off in Nakara, of all places, and goes to um, Kamara Junction on State of 73. So, they're not difficult reading. Um, they're, they're good if you just want a background on, on some of the issues that we are facing, then I'd recommend you go on the website and just have a look and, and see what's in them because they, they do make easy reading and it does give you a good appreciation for what the future holds for those two words in particular. How often do they get upgraded? So it's 2008 and you well, yeah, probably, I, I, would, I would say it would probably go on a six to ten year cycle, depending on where they are. Um, I haven't seen any plans to update them um, recently, but uh, they are a live document and they wouldn't be difficult to, um, to update from time to time. And I'd imagine that's on someone, somebody's radar to do. Uh, in terms of future projects, I thought I'd put a couple up there that aren't actually in Westland, but you'll be well aware of because these will have. This one in particular has a major um, benefit for tourism in the area, so that's the Dolomite Point uh, Pruning Pike project. We've got a um, bit of work that we're going to start off um, later on this year uh, doing a, a, a footpath cycleway right through that uh, whole Pruning Pike area. Um, so that will hopefully just make it a little bit more accessible. It's going to link the two ends of the, one of the walkways. Um, the Karari and the Kernfaki River. Yeah, those two trails, so um, we'll link those up. That's where that's going. And um, the, at the Ahara Bridge, um, which is starting here, uh, won't do a lot for the coast in terms of economic activity apart from the contract itself and the workers that are there, but um, it will be a, a significant improvement to uh, their crossing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just um, by way of other projects um, in Westland in the future, um, we are relocating the um, walkway clip on that we had on the Tira Macau Road Rail Bridge uh, down to the Tartary Bridge at Franz Joseph. So that will just provide a little bit um, better connection for walkers and cyclists between um, the two ends of the um, Franz Joseph Township. Um, we're actually looking, quite looking forward to getting that job underway. It's a good use of the clip ons which are presently still sitting at Tira Macau. Um, and we'll use that same project to upgrade the guardrail and the approach to that bridge as well. Um, what we call the Manakai Armour or the Manakai Bridge um, and the Taipo Bridge. Uh, we're upgrading the handrail systems on those, getting rid of the uh, pipe and wooden handrails and putting a, an approved guardrail system on both of those bridges. Um, also in the future we're hoping to be able to subject to getting funding for it, um, but we're hoping to um, improve some of the passing bays, sorry, the, the stopping bays alongside the highway, and um, um, a lot of those are of course um, at areas where there's good vistas up and down the highway where people want to stop and look and take photographs, so that's on our radar. Um, more bridges, more uh, barriers and guardrail just to provide better site protection um, places. More one lane bridge improvements. Improvements, we've got a, another five, I think, that we're um, investigating at the moment for um, well, we're actually designing the design. We're funding the design of five more bridges um, so that they'll be in a draw ready to go. We can get funding for those. Does that include the open bridge? Through the safety issues? No, no, not the right situation. You know about our concerns regarding the cycle right now. Yeah, I do, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Um, bit of driver information, so we'd like to put in more um, variable message signs um, and, and bit of travel information up and down the highway, and we're hoping to be able to link into the um, the new fibre cable that's being laid between uh, Fox Place here and 
and how we have that project in Southern Way later on this year, um, that's going to be a real boom to the communication in that area. So we would like to be able to get you back off that, and we're, we're talking with the chorus at the moment to get some um, points put on where we can link them to um, put up our, our signs and things to that fire system. So just to provide a lot of better information to travellers. And, and of course, just with improving the resilience of the corridor where we can. Is it possible, Colin, to add live streaming to certain critical aspects? Yes, yeah, that, that, um, that is one thing that we're very keen on doing is getting more cameras up and down the network so yeah. we can actually see real time what is going on. And Epitaph is one of the sites that we would be keen to um, just put a monitoring camera on so we can see exactly what's happening there. And not a, not, if not a camera, then certainly some um, some warning system. So if, if it does move suddenly, um, then we, we know about it straight away. Um, you know, as soon as possible. So what we're really fearful of is something happening in the middle of the night and someone driving into it. So any systems that we can put in place to improve all that monitoring, then we're up and up to. Okay, well that's probably, there's, there's a couple more slides, but I think I've taken up enough of your time, so if there, if there are any more questions, then... Thanks, uh, thanks Colin. Can, can I just uh, pick up on a, a couple of early ones? Jane, you raised the issue about speed limits. Yeah, so I've got a few things I want to raise. <laughs> yeah, just uh, to sort of give some context, Colin, um, changing the speed limit on the highway is an onerous task. Yes. We've had um, a number of requests to um, obviously push the 50k sign uh, speed limit out from Hoka to both ends. Yep. But we forever come up with roadblocks. It seems like a no-brainer to everyone, but can you just tell us what, what the process actually is? Yeah, the, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a difficult process, but it's a long-winded process, I guess is the best way of putting it. Um, and we are aware that you know, there's been talk about uh, the, the Hokitika Bridge um, approach to town, and also we're quite interested in investigating a change of the glowworm down up there because there's lots of people in that area too. Um, so the, the way it works is um, we, uh, it's a matter of discussing it with our national office, a guy in the FE called Ben Bunting, who, who uh, is the principal lead in, in that sort of work. Um, he'll, he'll um, basically start prioritising sites. We have got uh, this, this uh, a review that just basically cycles up and down the country from, from year to year and picks on areas to, to look at. There are two on the west coast that are scheduled for this year. One is the Charleston to Greymouth route on State I-6 and the other one is uh, further south State I-6 from uh, the Wanganui River down to Fox Basin, which is another one that I'm going to do a complete review on. Uh, the isolated areas like Hokitik Bridge and Glowwind Dells, yes, we can deal with them, but it's just a matter of putting a good case forward and then working through the process. It's a legislative process and it, it's, it's, it is a little bit onerous working way through, but it's not impossible and it will drive the right outcome. So. And would MZTA generally support local communities' wishes? Yeah, we certainly, yeah. We, we certainly look at them all, yes, yeah, and there are, there are um, people that are given the opportunity to comment on them and certainly there's that full consultation phase that they go through as well. So it's a you know it's a robust it's a robust process but it's, it's like that so that um, we get consistency right up there in the country. We don't you know we don't we don't want speed levels that are inappropriate for um, the, the particular area that they've got in. So let's try and you know, get some uniformity across the whole of the country. Thank you. Councillor Thank you. Just um, in terms of the um, those highest risk sites there, Tom, yeah. what, what site do you think would uh, would potentially cause the, uh, the biggest uh, loss of sleep? Yes. Yeah. I think at, at the moment, um, I would say it's probably uh, through the house pass, um, from Thunder Falls right through. Um, to be on the bridge, but there are still a lot of really, a lot of you know really um, tenuous sites through there that um, are going to be dealing with at some some stage in the future. And uh, such a um, a violent river when it, when it 
if when it really gets going and um, when it comes up so high that you know, can cause a lot of damage and we can lose the road in the 20s. So I think that would be the one that would worry us the most. On, uh, on your way down today, you'd have seen a lot of NZTA signs that are old and crusty and horrible. What can we do with that? I was looking, uh, we should not, I didn't really see that many, to be honest. You left it you must have your eyes closed. Who <laughs> <laughs> was driving the car? Yeah, I, I, am, I am aware that um, yeah, they are a bit of a, it is a bit of a, um, um, yeah, to just a contentious topic at the moment. Basically, our, our contract is driven by our performance criteria. So if the sign is still visible and you can read it easily, and it's still, still got all the right reflectivity um, characteristics at night, then uh, we'll leave it alone. They're, they're, not, they're not cheap to replace. Um, there, are, there are a number that, are, that could do with a good clean, and we've raised that with the contractor um, already, and uh, we hope that that'll be dealt with. But um, in terms of the overall condition of them, as long as you can read them and they still do what they're supposed to do at night and they provide clear direction, then we'll leave them alone. They're not, they're not cheap items to replace, so it's sort of what drives it over. That's all actually. Just, just three little quick things. I was just wondering whether you put it, is there any other clip on left over after Tartree and whether there would be any thought to put it onto Stony Creek because it's the most dangerous area in France, Joseph Stony Creek with two rock trucks going either way and ice, you know, if there was anything left over, down the track could have been looked at putting it on there. Um, the other thing is with NZTA, you look at putting a big steel gate on the gravel storage area of Docketies because the Candavans are back in there doing their business. And to Peter, to, to give you some credit where it's due, um, I've seen a lot of proactive work in South Westland and the creeks and everything like that. So uh, that's good to see. Thank you. Yeah. Very good to see. So I'm not all in This one, fine. You say you're struggling to find rock. Um, rock is a major issue, obviously. If we do get Waiho $20 million approved, what is the solution for that? Um, we've, we've raised the issue with the regional council and they're certainly very much in tune with it as well because they, they face exactly the same problems that we do. They always struggle with the rock for their protection with. So we've, we've, we've pulled out a number of old reports going back to the 80s. Um, it was a really good one done, I think, in 1985 about uh, all the quarries that are um, on the west coast and what which, you know, which ones were providing good rock. Um, the challenge is to be able to get into them again and open them up and actually quarry them. So, and it's more, it, it's, it's more of an issue for the, for the regional council um, to resolve than us because it's obviously quite rigorous and seeking environments around it. Um, but it's just something that we need to work through with them. And I think, um, you know, everybody's aware that it's an issue, but it's just something we've got to keep, keep um, you know, talking about, to be honest. I'll just add a little bit further to that. Um, we do have good resource still available at Wataroa, and, um, and, and that's not a concern. Our biggest concern is um, generally south of uh, south of Fox Glacier, so it's more in uh, in the I don't know what you want to call it deep southwestland area rather than around French Joseph and Wataroa. Um, we also have issues uh, in the, the central and northern. Um, West Coast area with supply to rock, but as it relates to the Waiho, um, we do have good rock at Wadawara and a reasonable, um, well, a reasonable uh, security of supply there. There's a good reserve. Thank you, sir. Through, through your worship, where, where's, where does the rock come from for Bruce Bay? From, from, from Paringa is our, is our yeah. main source. Yeah. 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 But as I said before, it's not particularly good quality rock. By the time you're Quarry it and then you know you blast it, quarry it, transfer it to trucks, take the site, unload it, then move it around. It crumbles. Does does tend to break down quite a bit. Yes, it, it is a challenge. And there's uh, the proposal to uh, reopen quarry at Sugarloaf. Yeah, I'm not aware of that one. <coughs> it's it's 
trekking through the regional council at the moment. Oh, okay. right. we, I mean, we'll, we'll look at any options that, that are available to us, um, but the advice we have so far is that that's not going to be any better quality than what we have access to currently. Okay. So Councillors Kennedy and uh, Cogan, any questions before we move on? Uh, no, oh, just on the uh, WIHO, I know it's really important that the Regional Council, the District Council and Transit work together to form a real good solution. I do have <coughs> one bugbear um, is high shoulder, um, especially if you were to drive down uh, south of Harry Harry on the La Fontaine Strait behind someone that's sped out the window, there's a dangerous amount of water being left on the road. I've been told before that it's a um, contestable work fund, but it's a, I believe it's a safety issue um, and part of basic road maintenance. So just a comment, I'd really like to see the high shoulder taken care of around the place. Cheers. Uh, Councillor Coke. Um, Councillor Coke, just on the Yes, look, thanks very much for your presentation today. Um, it's good and I'm very pleased to see... Um, a number of the ones that you put under high risk um, because that's obviously very real to us living over here on the coast. The problem with, um, even though the presentation was good to hear, it still it hasn't given me a lot of confidence, to be honest, because simply because we are still talking about things like... Um, you spoke about uh, we've got it under control at the moment and short to medium term, these are the options. Um, but the reality is, and with a number of those high risk um, areas we talk about and the reality of significant events happening back over here again, um, it's not a case of if, but when, um, it leaves the coast extremely vulnerable. And when we're trying to bring back an economy, I mean, and, and of course, on top of that now we've had COVID, but when we're trying to work on improving the economy over here, we're extremely reliant on our roading infrastructure being in place um, and having backup plans in place for that roading Im infrastructure to give confidence to not just tourists, but also uh, when you're talking to, you know, and we're dealing with tour operators and stuff as well, um, but also businesses, freighting businesses. There's a lots of businesses, even regardless of tourism over here, that um, it has a huge impact on. And it, it, it's just, it's just, oh, from what I've seen, you know, and, in the past is there always seems to be so much money every year with budgets, with New Zealand budgets around roading, um, heading up north. Uh, there's very little heading um, over into our area. You just spoke earlier on about, you know, a lot of maintenance and stuff hasn't been done on our roads over here since the 1960s. Well, why not? You know, is it because we are a low population base over here and they don't think that it's a significant enough location to have more money fed into it? What You know, why with some of this high-risk stuff are we um, only talking about short-term and under-control at the moment issues? What, why aren't there some plans in place to, to at least... Um, give us some confidence that some of these issues are genuinely getting money put aside and getting some real um, value put into the reality that, yeah, they, they're serious concerns to us and they can be the difference and will be the difference between whether the coast can survive or not. We, we can't afford to have constant significant events like we've had and roading works out as we've seen in the last couple of years, it's, it'll drive the economy away, it'll drive businesses away and it'll give nobody any trust and faith in wanting to travel over to our region. For your worship, it is a difficult one and, and this is a challenge that we battle with every day in, in, our, in our lives at NZTA. Um, and to, to be fair, um, 
the, the um, weighing up doing work on State Highway 6 through, through South Westland, when you compare it with you know, with a traffic volume of about a thousand vehicles a day, sure that you know a lot of that is feeding the economy. But when you compare that with the likes of um, State Highway One south of Auckland, which is now carrying twenty to thirty vehicles, twenty to thirty thousand vehicles a day, um, it's it's just a matter of trying to get the balance right. And as I said, this is a dilemma that we're constantly um, working with, and and it's it's our it's our world. And it's really about trying to get the best value that we can throughout the country and managing the risk around these sites as well. Um, I can give you an absolute assurance that uh, it is our mission in life to keep State Highway 6 open um, every day if we can. There are certain things, I mean, it's, they don't call it the great untamed wilderness for nothing, that's what it is. And, and by that very fact, it comes with its challenges. And it's just a matter of managing them and managing the risks around that and, and doing our very best with what we do here. Colin, that would be, uh, sorry, Councillor um, Yeah, Yeah, um, just a couple of things, thank you. I don't, don't envy you your job at all, seeing those photos where the bridges are completely undermined and all the rest of it, yeah, so <laughs> um, thank you for what you do do. I guess two things is um, the planning for cyclists and pedestrians. So that cycleway on the Haikataka Bridge is awful to cycle over, you know, and the school kids, doing it, it's horrible. So I hope when you do the clip on, on the Tartary, that it is a lot wider and more, yeah. It's, the same, it's the same width as it was on the on Terramac House. You have a bike going to the Terramac House, I don't know. Oh, it's a bit wider than that. Yeah. It, it, it is only fit for, um, so the, the one on the Tartary is only fit for, for bikes in one direction, but it does have passing opportunities partway. So it will have two, um, spots for cyclists or pedestrians. So it's not just the, 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 the passing, but you get a big truck and trailer come behind you and they don't keep a meter distance, they are very close and it's just whoosh and you've got no space. So yes, the, 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 the tar tree wall is a separate structure attached to the side yeah. of it and there is, um, as part of that project, a guardrail upgrade uh, occurring which will be thriving, which probably doesn't mean much, but it's the really deep um, guardrail um, that, that we have, it, it won't, um, I mean we can't get away from the fact that it is pedestrians beside um, beside a state highway and, and we can't we can't change that without building a separate structure um, but it is as, as separate as we can get and we have factored in um, as much uh, separation as we can achieve. But on that also you can't, you're still going to have them there but if they're going slower it's a lot better as well. It's another push for the 50k going through there. And just any new bridges that are being done, all roads, should be catering to pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah. And, and yeah. they are, and, and you'll see that on the Tiara and Cow, the new Tiara and Cow Bridge, and the, the, the Harrow Bridge. Um, yeah, they've got really good cycle, cycle pedestrian facilities on there. Just one other query is and you did talk about consultation. Where was the consultation for our staff portals pass? A couple of weeks ago, because we, we went to the meeting. <laughs> um, no, no, that was post. <laughs> no, the, we, were, we were actually planning to have a meeting um, before before COVID. There was a, a meeting scheduled for March, but of course that was that was cool. um, So yeah, I, I mean, it was a, it was an interesting meeting to go to, and it was um, although it was um, quite a challenging meeting. I think we we certainly got a lot out of it, and. Uh, I'd like to say we listen, and we are we are um, changing um, you know, what, what we're planning on doing. So um, I guess that's the consultation that came came out of that. But um, so generally, there would have been consultation first. Like, you know, no, no, normally, we have a meeting with particularly with that cast of health communities. We're meeting every year uh, to go through you know, uh, any issues that have come up uh, following since or during the previous winter. And, what we do better, so they have been actually working every year with that customer. I appreciate the change, and it's sort of shame that there's a whole what one or two weekends lost. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've talked about that, but the major, the major issue here was ice, it wasn't snow, it was just ice on the roads, it's what close, it's not snow. Well, uh, we can put Kerry uh, on the spot for the councillors. Yeah, I'll speak to the lady. 
Um, thank you so much for coming along. Very comprehensive report. I've learned, I've learned a lot just sitting in the uh, and good work on the uh, on the change of direction for your the change thing. I mean, that was well done. It's always hard to change once you set things in motion. Yeah. Well done on that. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again because this is this is really good. Learned a lot. Thank you, councillors. I think that's uh, yeah. Yeah. been a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know that beyond you, um, there isn't much north of the Terra but we do look, um, <laughs> you know, walk point? away from past years. Oh, 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 Councillors, can I invite uh, someone to move that the report from the NZTA be received? Councillor Newman, Councillor Hartwood. Thanks, uh, Ryan. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. See you again. Move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the DIA Oversight Group verbal update. And Richard uh, Richard Hart, Hardy has been sitting there very, very patient for the last uh, last hour. Thanks, Richard, and welcome. Kia ora koto. And um, can everybody hear me okay? All good? I can see one. Yep. Okay, that's excellent. Um, Your Worship, the Mayor, Councillors and uh, Iwi representatives, that's uh, Paul Madrick. Are you there? And Francois... Yeah, uh, look, I want to thank you so much for having me along today. Uh, this is this has been quite a journey for um, the council and for the Department of Internal Affairs around this um, oversight period that we're in. And we wanted to have an opportunity to be able to speak with you directly, councillors, about the process that we've been involved in and um, what's uh, where we're heading in terms of the um, oversight work that my team has been involved in. I'm the manager of operational policy at Department of Internal Affairs. And that basically means that I support the minister in one of her primary local government roles around um, overseeing the performance of councils around the country and supporting councils to um, operate at their full potential. I have with me, um, and I'm just gonna turn this here, um, Dave Spence. He's my senior analyst uh, in my team who's been uh, working with, um, with uh, Simon Bastian, with your CE and, and his team on uh, the various parts of the oversight committee's work. What I wanted to do today is um, to talk you through uh, very quickly a bit of the background to how we got to where we are today. Um, talk about the oversight committee's process so that you can understand um, what, we've, what we've been looking at um, and then talk about the time frames and next steps and any questions after that. Um, hopefully it won't take too long but I'm really keen if you have any, any questions or issues or concerns that we're able to um, have a conversation about that today. Um, anything before I start or shall I just launch in your worship? Please launch into it. Okay perfect. Okay so under part 10 of the Local Government Act, the uh, Minister has uh, intervention powers which allows her to, their regulatory powers um, under the Act, to monitor the performance of councils. And there are certain um, things that she can do if the Minister feels that um, some sort of intervention is needed. I don't want to dwell on the past history of how we got to intervention, but over the course of um, a couple of years, there were a number of issues that um, came to the Minister's attention around the um, performance of the Westland District Council. And we spent quite a bit of time investigating those um, concerns um, through to last year. It led to, in July 2019, to the Minister deciding to appoint a Crown Observer, which is basically um, having somebody come in and just monitor the performance of the Council. 
as part of this process, um, the council is given the right to look at the information that the minister has made a decision on and provide evidence to say why the Crown Observer should or shouldn't be appointed. We worked through a really robust process and in November, based on the information that um, uh, the Mayor and the Chief Executive had provided, the Minister made a decision not to appoint a Crown Observer, but she did want to have confidence that the steps that were being taken, the um, really good and positive steps that were being taken by the um, by the Council as a whole were really embedded into the ongoing performance of the Council. And so to do this, she decided, oh, she decided to establish um, what we've called an oversight committee. And essentially the oversight committee was put in place for six months through, through to the end of June uh, 2020 to be able to really um, have, a, have a deep dive into all those areas of council activity um, that are really important for councils to be delivering to their communities. I mean, the fundamental principle that we work to um, in terms of the Local Government Act is that councils are accountable to their communities, not to a minister. So she's keen to make sure that's actually happening. All this information that led to the appointment of the Oversight Committee has been um, proactively released on the DIA website. So if you're interested, councillors, in going back and having a look at the timeline and process, it's all available. But we're moving forward now, and it's been, I think, a, a really positive experience um, across the board from, from where I'm sitting. What the Minister is looking for, and I think this is important, she's looking for um, to ensure that there is best practice across the key areas of council activity and council accountability. She's looking for a really strong and aligned governance around the council table and also the relationship between the governance structures and the management structures. And I'm, I really, I'm keen to make sure you understand that this isn't, this isn't about everybody being happy and um, dancing around the maypole. Um, but it's about actually the opportunity for really good and robust open debate that's supported by really good documents and and um, and uh, or the information to a decision making. And it's also not about setting standards for the Westland District Council that are higher than. Um, those that other councils um, adhere to. And we work with councils all over the country. So um, you know, one of the things that we are able to do, particularly through this oversight period, is give the minister confidence that when we're making um, an observation about the performance of the council, it's in the context of what is expected across the board. So the oversight committee process, um, the committee is made up of um, the key members are officials from Department of Internal Affairs um, and also Department of, I oh, sorry, the Ministry for the Environment. That's because of their RMA powers under the Resource Management Act. It's, uh, there's a, a, the councils have a really important role under the Resource Management Act and it's, um, MFE is best placed to be able to provide that advice. We also have, um, in an observer capacity, we have the Auditor General's Office and the Ombudsman, and then we get um, input from other agencies like NZTA, um, NB, MB also, that's Ministry for Building, Industry and Enterprise. Um, and then also uh, the Regional Council has provided some information to us. So there's quite a broad array of um, information that's being gathered by the oversight committee to really understand how the council is performing and um, to help us be able to provide really good advice to the uh, minister. Now here I want to, I really do want to acknowledge the um, cooperation and support that um, your worship, Mayor Smith has provided, um, but also especially uh, the work that Leslie and Simon have done to be able to give us the information that we've asked for and for the clarity that they've been able to provide to some of the things that we've been seeing. It's been really crucial, that cooperation to helping us get to where we are today. Um, in terms of how DIA is involved and a bit of what Dave's been doing, 
He spent a lot of time um, reviewing uh, meetings and documents that have been prepared for meetings. He's been looking at all the different processes, um, th uh, particularly through the consultation and engagement processes. Uh, we've um, also reviewed uh, other documents that have come through the council or reports that have been repaired, prepared about the council by the likes of uh, the Auditor General's Office and the um, uh, NZTA. And these, I, sorry, I don't want to mean they're specific Westland District Council reports. These are national reports where Westland District Council is, is featured alongside all the other councils. Um, it's given us a really good and comprehensive view of the internal workings of the council and the impact that the council is now having out in the community. We have completed one interim report to the minister and that will be released um, once we get the final report done. But essentially, um, the interim report highlighted the key areas that we're looking for and um, the progress that's been made on that. And the minister was very happy with the progress that she's seen. Just to give you an idea of the structure, what we've done is we're reviewing the performance areas that are aligned with the local government New Zealand's um, council mark strategy and assessment process. So that's integrated into what LGNZ sees as being examples of best practice. That's around four areas, governance and leadership, financial decision-making, service delivery, that includes asset management and engagement with the public, the consultation side. So the governance and leadership and financial decision-making and how that all mixes into the services that are delivered and then public consultation. So the interim report basically said that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that actually we've, we've been really um, encouraged by the progress, well, not by the work that is going on to um, deliver a number of things, particularly around the induction process for new councillors following the election, and also around the policies and procedures that are now in place for making sure that really good decisions are made and good and robust decisions. Not necessarily the decisions that everybody um, wants all the time, but actually it's, it's, it's aligned with best practice, which is really good. The other area that has been particularly pleasing that we're, um, we're, um, we're looking at closely is around council controlled organizations and the changes that have been implemented around there to ensure that councillors really have good oversight of the, um, the performance of your council controlled organisations. So in terms of what's happening now, the oversight period comes to an end at the end of June, and we're just in the process of finalising the oversight committee's report, which will be provided to the minister. And that will enable her to make a decision on whether or not um, this close monitoring by the oversight committee is still required. I should say the decision ministers make is not about whether there is still a need for Crown intervention. We've already determined that there isn't a need for formal Crown intervention. It's just around um, the, the uh, work, yeah, the work that the oversight committee is doing. So that's pretty much at a high level the, the process that we've been following today. And I'm very um, keen now to open it up to questions around, um, around the oversight committee, the work we're trying to do and any, anything else you might have in terms of concerns or, or ideas around what we're doing. Thanks, uh, Richard. Um, let's, uh, let's open it up, uh, Councillor Coburn. Oh, you're yeah, muted, Councillor. Sorry. There you go. You're Sorry good. about that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. Um, nice to meet you and listen to what you've got to say today. Um, it's really nice to be able to hear. Um, we've come, we, 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 I certainly believe as a council, we've come a long way since all of this was originally uh, raised. Um, the only confidence that I could probably... Um, bring to the table at this point as being a new councillor, um, 
I, I really don't want to um, focus on what went on in the past. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, we are here as a new council to focus on what we can do. We've got some big challenges ahead of us. Um, well, well um, recognised that for that to happen and for us, we must be all working together a lot more closely and there being a lot of collaboration, lots of information. Uh, you certainly, I certainly can't complain about the information we've been fed because <laughs> too much to, to be fair, David, it's like information overload and it'll take us three years to actually get our heads around it all. But it's there and it's very accessible. Um, and I've, um, in the defence of council at the moment, I've got to say um, I'm thoroughly enjoying the team of councillors that we have around the table, the open discussions and debates I feel we're having an absolute confidence and support in our executive team, um, the council workers in general, and uh, both Simon and our mayor. Mm. Look, Councillor Kogan, thank you very much for that feedback. That's really encouraging to hear. One thing I should um, hasten to add is that um, when I talk about progress, I'm not talking about progress just from when the minister decided in November make um, not to proceed with the Crown appointment. This progress has been going on for some time um, and you know, Simon and his worship the mayor have led um, some steady work in terms of identifying areas for improvement and also working with us to sort of help us understand some of the context that sat behind some of the other things that um, were coming across the minister's table. So um, yeah, it is it is it is encouraging to hear that you feel as a first um, first time councillor that you are in a place where you are able to make informed decisions. And I might roll you out to other councils to just say how much fun it can be to be a, a councillor at some point. <laughs> councillor Kennedy. Uh, no, nothing from you. Uh, from me, thanks, uh, Richard. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Kennedy, what's the um, what's the trophy behind? <laughs> oh, this is the um, this is the Woodham Shield. It's um, yeah, it's better to have than the Ranfurly Shield, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Hey, Councillor David. Nah, all good, Richard. Everything's Thank good. You. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Neil. Yeah, certainly I'm very aware that changes did need to be made and it's been great to see that changes have been made. And, um, yeah, thank you for your part in that. Thank you. Councillor Yeah, I fully support what uh, Councillor Neil and uh, Councillor Kogan said. Um, we've got a great team here and uh, full trust in everybody here. To be me, brothers. Um, Richard. Just wondering what the process is from the end of June. Do I take it that the oversight term uh, terminates as at that date, or does that depend on the, on the minister's final decision? So, so the term itself ends um, for the ends on the 30th of June, but the minister will make a, dis a determination if close monitoring is still required. Um, at this point, the um, the indicators are really positive, so. Um, it, but it is her decision to make. What's going to happen is we'll finalise the report and then there'll be an opportunity for um, the council fact check it so that we are, so they're across um, the findings of the oversight committee and they have the opportunity to um, to just, uh, if, we've, if we've misrepresented anything to actually um, clarify that. We'll work through um, the chief executive on that one, but I'm sure he will share that with you councillors if there's anything that is of concern or anything that requires additional information. And then we're anticipating uh, putting this in front of the minister around mid-July and we'll be in touch with you on that. We will also work with you, with the council um, through Simon and Leslie on um, just coordinating a media release following that briefing, because I think it's important um, that we acknowledge, you know, the hard work that's gone into this. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Um, thank you, Your Worship. The, uh, the, the council um, that we have today, is, it just can't be compared to what it was um, prior um, October. It's, um, this is a really cohesive team and it's working um, extremely well 
and positively uh, on all issues. The um, uh, the process from the um, lead from the management has been has been positive. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it is working really well. So I I, uh, I hope that's reflected in the, in the review. Mm. Um, thank you. Yes. Uh, I think one of the things that came through, so I, I've travelled um, uh, several times now to Westland District Council and most recently it was when you were receiving your induction through from the Auditor General's office when Andrea Reeves was down here, down there and, you know, the looking at how engaged councillors were and I think the ability of councillors to feel that if they need information or additional information or clarity, they have confidence in the um, senior management of the council to receive that information, and that that's really positive. So it's um, it's it's good. Council Martin. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Richard, for your update. Um, I can't um, you know talk out of line with you know, the comments that have been made by our councillors already. I think um, it's pretty consistent, the message you're hearing. Um, I think one of the biggest changes that I've seen over the um, three different terms of council is the actual inclusion of um, our iwi as a voice in our governance. Mm -hmm. And I think that has created uh, a huge shift in terms of the dynamic around this table and how we make decisions um, so we were discussing it earlier actually in the meeting and you may have picked up on it just how the steps, I know it's it's not necessarily related to the oversight work you're doing, but it's an aspect is uh, how do we ensure that um, this model is part of the governance of this council going forward and it, and it isn't something that can just be um, sort of changed at a whim. I think um, what you're describing there, Councillor Martin, um, is certainly in line with Minister Mahuta's um, desire to see much better inclusion and integration of um, iwi um, around the table. Um, and this is particularly coming through in terms of the post-COVID lockdown um, response around how do how do how does a council ensure that it is representing all the communities, but particularly the iwi voice at the council table. And uh, Westland is certainly many steps ahead uh, in terms of, of that and then, then a number of councils around the country. So it's really important. And I do acknowledge that the important voice of um, Paul and Francois around the table and how that has contributed to some really good decision-making. Councillor Hart. Um, thank you. Thanks, Richard, for the update. I think uh, Councillor Kogan's covered it all for us, but but I I too am a first time councillor, so um, yeah, we're doing a lot of learning and a lot of reading, and yeah, I'm um, enjoying working with the team and mm. and the exec team. So yeah, mm. positive from here. Well, that's, that's really um, good to hear. And I think the importance of not being distracted by um, central government agencies like DIA having to come in and, and sort of, and do what is, I think, an important role because things don't always go smoothly from time to time. But at the end of the day, this is about you being able to serve your communities. And um, you don't need me looking over your shoulder to be to be able to do that effectively and so again um you know i really uh, acknowledge uh, his worship the mayor and and the chief executive's role in in enabling you guys to do that so keep keep up the good work well council is um a good report a good report and uh, uh, dave uh uh, Spence, you were in the background there, you're hiding, of course. Um, yes. Thank you for your assistance over the last uh, many, many months. And and, uh, uh, and Richard, you've been, uh, you were the first person that turned up to pop along and sit in the meeting, I think it was three or three and a half, nearly four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate the uh, the guidance you've given us. Um, I think you've, you've um, overrated my input, the, the input that's been most valuable has been Chief Executive and uh, Leslie, 
uh, and yourself. And, and I'm happy to take a bit of the kudos, but I can tell you it, it rests firmly on the shoulders. Uh, thank you. Uh, so if anybody does have want to follow up on anything or have any particular questions, um, I'm the point of contact for this. You've got my email address I can see right there on the screen. <laughs> That's great. But, um, uh, but also, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to answer any questions and uh, make sure there's, you know, things are transparent from our end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard and, uh, and Dave. And uh, councillors will, will um, like uh, someone to move that the report be received. Uh, it's Councillor Kennedy, Councillor Cogan. Those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you very much, gentlemen. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, next, the next item on the agenda is the is number eight, which is the staff report. It's the financial report for May 2020, uh, and it's on pages 7 to 21 of your agenda. And I'd ask uh, the Corporate Services Manager to present it. I love the background there, it's great. It's just Go ahead. very, very good. I'm sorry, Carol. No, it's all right. Uh, through your, you, your worship, uh, I'll take the report with Red. Um, we'll take any questions. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, we'll go around the table and uh, Councillor Hatchell. Right, okay. Councillor Lucia. I can't find it straight away, but um, note four expected refuse fees was 254000 down. Come on, sorry. Sorry, the refuse rubbish fees was a lot down. Why was it? Yeah, it may have seen seen some of them, um, but um, it goes up and down sometimes. Last year it was probably we've budgeted on the fact that we have so many um, events that would affect that uh, this year. We haven't had an element. I don't actually really have any. <laughs> Councillor Davis. I think for me. Councillor Coyle. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> okay. You're muted, Jenny. Okay. Councillor Kennedy. Um, no, nothing really. I just um, have a concern about um, <clears throat> these capital projects not being done um, and just moving forward. I don't want it to spiral out of control in terms of our capital expenditure. I just want to make sure we get these projects done if we can. Thanks. I do think we have been hampered this year as well with the COVID lockdown. You know, non-essential work wasn't able to carry on at that point in time. Plus, um, we have a capital um, programme there, which we've had to scope and get asset information, which we are doing. And, and now we're probably in a better position going forward to be able to make sure that we get those projects done. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Uh, Councillor Cogan, can you just confirm that you didn't have a question? <laughs> Sorry, through the sheer. Yeah, like what all I really needed to do was go like this, to be honest. <laughs> but, yeah, just no no questions and great work, Leslie, and your team for a very comprehensive report again. Councillor Hart. Um, I, I'm st I still get concerned about the debtors being 61% above 90 days, but... I think every time I it's timing, isn't it? In relation to yeah, a yeah, lot of it is timing, uh, and you're talking about debtors. Yeah, right? debtors. Yeah. So yeah, I've had a look to see what those debtors are, and mainly it's one organisation. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm not going to mention which one it is, but um, they did. It, it's a timing on their part. They okay. have investments. And they did inform us that there would be a delay for them. We don't want them to have a penalty on interest um, by bringing those um, investments back. Mm -hmm. So it, it is really that. Yeah, and because it, it is quite substantial, isn't it, across yeah. the, the whole the whole debt is right. As long as we yeah are on, we, we, we do know some of these um, are organisations that are on payment plans. So okay. It looks so like we are a big debt, but they're just paying it off okay. over, over yep. a period of time. For that. No, that was really all from me. Yep. 
Thank you. Councillor Mark. Thank you, um, Your Worship. Through the Chair, um, thanks, Leslie, for the report. I'm also on debtors on page 18, and I'm curious around the, um, if I'm reading this correctly, that um, $935,000 in arrears for the 31st of May 2019. Mm -hmm. So that's last financial year. This is the rates debt. Yeah, this rates debt. So yeah. un so and to cut through, we've got nearly a million dollars of unpaid rates in the previous financial year. In the previous financial year, yes, but yeah. that's come down hugely if you remember. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. every month that has gone down. Yes, it's increased this time, but with the COVID situation we put rates relief in there. Yeah. So there is deferrals and payment plans. So I think you're going to inevitably, I can't say that, uh, <laughs> see that figure increase while we're, we're going through that payment plan process. Yeah, and in res regard to that, we've got provision within our within our budgeting for this year's annual plan to yeah. allow for any uh, variations in terms of payment plans and the like for people paying their rates. So we have got a downfall debt provision within our financial year. Mm -hmm. And that is off hand I couldn't tell you how much oh, yeah. that cool. but I can find out for you and let know. Yeah that that would be useful. And I do share the similar concerns around capital works. I mean I I do like the reporting, the capital expenditure reporting that we have at a high level. And it's but it does because it's at a high level it, it probably looks more distorted in terms of what we have and haven't achieved. So I, I appreciate COVID and I appreciate the fact that for a number of months we could not actually undertake physical works. But um, I guess this is it's a consistent theme that comes up year on year in terms of carryovers, financial uh, controls around project management. And uh, if we actually are, I do have the cap capacity, not necessarily the capability to complete all of our budgeted works, um, Sorry. Yeah, so the, the question here is, um, and you could, may not be in a position to answer it, but are we on track to um, complete our capital works project for the, for the year end? We won't finish the 100%, and, and I think you see the comments in there that it's saying that some of these will be carried over. Yep. And again, this goes down to the fact that we haven't had that asset information. Uh, we are getting um, a lot more asset information and that will actually going forward, we'll be able to plan our projects better. Um, again, some of these things, we these projects were put in based on just knowledge or what was assumed, but with this asset information, we find that um, perhaps those assumptions were not correct mm. and that maybe we can delay some of those. In in terms of priority, just a further question, my final question, Your Worship, around, I think under water supply, there was like the water meters to be installed in this uh, financial year and which would have a flow on effect for our budget and our planning and potentially, I assume the reason water meters are installed for commercial premises to regulate their water use and to charge it appropriately. I just wonder if that has been given any thought in terms of uh, actually progressing that because if we strike the rates in a few days time based on a flat a fixed charge as opposed to a commercial metered water rate it's going to potentially a discrepancy for our budget we I, could i uh, as far as we we're getting the water meters in um yes we've been carrying out a program there um, it's not completed as the water but we've still got budget there um, as far as um, our budgets are concerned, you know, we know what we've got meters in for, and we'll budget appropriately on that, and we do charge a commercial water rate for those that are, not, that are commercial, but not um, a water meter. Yeah. So we, we're budgeting appropriately based on whatever is in the, the rig. Yeah, so water meters that are installed in the next financial year won't be able to be rated for until the first year of the long-term plan. That was the gist of the, the point, that if we don't have them installed by the 30th of June this year, uh, it's another 12 months before any rating associated with them kicks in. Yeah, yeah. or rating as far as... Water, yeah, metered, metered rates, yeah. Thank you very much for responses to those questions. Cool. 
Ah, thank you, Mark. Deputy Mayor Brothers. Thank you for that, Leslie. I um, invite the councillor to resolve that council approves the total proposed. No, it's not. Moving up on. <laughs> um, resolve that council received a financial report to the 31st of May 2020. Councillor Neil, thank you. Councillor Hart, those in favour? Aye. Aye. And uh, those against? Thank you. Yes, the, uh, you've also got the next one, I believe, um, which is the rates, write offs, and emissions, so emissions mm. 2019 2020. And they're on pages 22 to 25 of your agenda. Thanks, Thank you. Um, do you, do you worship? I'll take this report as right as well. I'm taking questions. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, it may be useful just with the, the nature of this report to have a high level overview from the officer. Okay. Just, yeah. I, I don't know, I, I don't need it, but I know that there's some councils that, that may benefit from an under, a more in-depth understanding of what we're actually doing or proposing in this report. Okay, that would be, that would be useful. Yeah. yeah. So through our delegations manual, um, councillors are responsible for approving rates right offs they delegate um, the operating issues with rates, remissions, and write-offs to the finance team during the year. Um, so at year-end, we bring the report to council to show you where we've actually remitted and where we've actually written off rates. There can be various reasons for having to do this. Remissions generally, we try and have those in place by year-end. Uh, that way, um, on normal years, the so I mean, budget year is not the same, but on normal years, those remissions would then be um, integrated into the rate strike so that we're not losing any revenue. However, if we're not able to get those in place by year end, any remissions that can take place during the year will then um, be a loss to council as far as revenue is concerned. So this is the same with write-offs. Um, we legally have to write off rates, so there are over six years, and uh, other reasons for writing off may be incorrect rating information database information. So this report is just to bring um, these write off information that have actually taken place over the year, so that you can see where and why we've remitted or written mm -hmm. off rates. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank Does you. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks for that. Council, so are there any questions? Just, uh, I, I, just sort of, um, I just sort of had one, if I may. Um, it's quite substantially bigger than last year. Um, is that, how, what's that related? I mean, I see the biggest changes in uniform charges. What, is that due to that write-off? Um, or the remission for that property? Yes, it is. Yeah. Because uh, each one had an individual charge, and there were, I can't remember how many, was, there were a significant amount of units, and each one of them had a uniform charge, right. and that's actually been okay. remitted. Yep. Yep, that's all. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I invite Council to uh, move the resolution on uh, the rates right now. Oh, yeah, Councillor Hart, do you want to second that? I'll second that, Your Worship. Councillor Martin, those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Um, next item on the agenda is the Muslim Cemetery paper ticket. It's on pages 26 to page 30 of your agenda. And I'll invite uh, Lewis up to um, give us the lowdown on it. It's a good report, it's relatively easy to follow. Yeah, it's good. Good afternoon, Your Worship and Councillors. Um, I take the report as read. The purpose of the report is just to update Council on the need for a Muslim grave area in the Hakitika Cemetery. Uh, and, uh, which came about as uh, Muslim leaders approached council for that option. And also the report clearly spells out that it needs a different approach um, uh, to the normal um, undertaking for, 
for cemetery services. And so we uh, therefore request our council to approve the formation of Muslim burial area within the section, the post section of the particular cemetery. Thanks, Lewis. And councillors will take the report as read. This has uh, been a process that staff have been working through at the request of uh, some of our local residents for 18 months or so. It's been a good process. Um, are there any questions? No, none for me. Someone would like to move the uh, council approve the formation. Uh, of a, sorry? Sorry. Uh, just a question. Ask some comments. Oh, yes. the, um, thank you, Your Worship. The, um, just a, a, a general comment. I mean, I have some sympathy for the position um, of, of this. Um, however, it's um, um, a little bit surprising. The um, Muslim community has always been represented in Westland. I mean, I went to school with Muslims. Um, so there's nothing new about that. And the numbers on that table uh, given here on 3.1 indicate about 20, 22 people um, increased from about 18 people. It's hardly a population explosion. Um, nevertheless, the, yeah, they have requested this and, um, and um, uh, if there is room there, I imagine that that is, um, is not in it, an issue. Um, according to that table, there are um, um, those of the Hindu faith would be um, have an obvious um, call on the council for the same um, because they are, they are um, four times as many um, in number. Um, yes, the, uh, and then the proposal which shows the areas that have been um, um, suggested at the cemetery, uh, whilst one is um, the triangular area, um, seems um, adequate in my view given those numbers. Um, I don't agree with the um, rectangular area um, to the uh, north of the RSA plot. Our cemetery is um, running out of space at a frightening rate. Um, and um, that, that area of, um, is the obvious next area of development in the cemetery, but, but the triangular area is no problem in my view. But, um, um, the two areas I think is um, unnecessary. That's my comment. Yeah, um, I thank you, um, Councillor. The uh, triangular area is the area proposed to be first developed. Um, those two areas have both been identified as possible areas for development. The firm development will definitely commence in the triangular area, and there's further. There's lots of space that way to further expand it that way. And if uh, that's a recommendation from the council, then we'll appropriate uh, and follow that recommendation. Thank you. Would any councillor object to that? We're sticking to the triangular area. Makes sense. Yeah, that's proposed, doesn't it? That's one proposed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, then on that basis, can we um, resolve that council approves the formation of a Muslim burial area within the pro proposed sections of the Hagatina Cemetery highlighted as a triangle on the plan. Um, Council Neil, Council Hartrell, those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Thanks, Louis. Next one so is... One, three wishes. Can I just clarify what, what is the designation of that rectangular area? There was two proposals before that's further development in that area as well. So that rectangular area now is available for general. The rectangular is not included in the resolution. Yes, yes. So that's that's you know, mm -hmm. part of the, uh, just, uh, um, again part of the general cemetery. Yes, so fine. Yeah. As you can see, the further east you go, there is quite a bit of expansion of room uh, in that plot. Goes almost all the way to the airport. Mm. Well, it does go all the way to the airport. So it's 
a lot of area, and obviously there are a lot of earthworks to, to make that fit for use in the future state. The next uh, item on the agenda, councillors, is to review the submission from Anthea Keenan in regards to the trespass notice. It's on pages 31 to 39 of your agenda, and ask the Chief Executive to present. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and good afternoon again to councillors. I believe everyone's aware of this incident back on 4th of April 2019. Um, through, through the process, um, Ms. Keenan made a complaint to the Ombudsman, and Ombudsman has investigated. I uh, found that um, a submission wasn't re uh, requested from Ms. Keenan to uh, explain her, her statement. Um, we have given her now the opportunity to do so, and that submission is part of the appendix. Um, and I'll take the rest of the report as read. It's, uh, it's on. Um, we'll take it as read, and we'll. Sorry, uh, Councillor Kennedy. Um, yeah, just uh, one question. Uh, where is Miss, uh, Mrs. Keenan? Has she been invited by the interweb or anything? I say that because if you were talking about me, I'd like to be here. Uh, she she was uh, asked to make a written submission, uh, which she's she's done. And she could be watching the live stream. And, and she, I'm, I'm quite confident she'll be watching the live stream. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Hartwell, going around the table. Um, my, from my point of view, I don't think it should, what was done should stand as it is. That's all I've got to say in the Council Neil. Um, I'm happy with the trespass order being finished um, at, a, at an early a date. Probably quite promptly, yeah. And what he was suggesting is an earlier date. Um, I think, was, was there a date stated in here? Can't remember, but yeah, few years of, maybe the end of this month, something like that, whatever it takes to put it into the process into being. Councillor Dowd. Yes, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, I think um, we should give uh, Mrs Keenan an olive branch, and um, I, um, I agree with um, Councillor uh, Neil. Councillor Cogan, uh, you're, you're on, you're, you're muted there, uh, Councillor, thank you. Yep, thanks, Your Worship. Um, yeah, so based on the information that's been provided um, uh, in the context of how this all came about in the first place, but also in recognising that um, Ms. Keenan did have an opportunity to be able to uh, correspond back with her submission. Um, I, I'm sorry, but I have no confidence through looking at the submission that she provided back and her response around a lot of things. Um, it doesn't give me any confidence that at this point, um, I believe that the trespass notice should actually be removed. Um, I think that there's still further discussion that needs to be held um, around all of that. I mean, as a, as a council, we all have a code of conduct that we need to abide by as, as councillors, and um, the same goes for the public. And at the moment, uh, with no apology um, and continued constant criticism, I don't support the trespass notice being um, given any uh, consideration for a shortened term. Uh, Councillor Kennedy. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I'm just a little bit uh, confused as to really what we're talking about. Um, in terms of the trespass, it said oh, she was trespassed because she said it's time the army bombed SMWDC da 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 cohorts. That's the kind of guts of it, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, do we really believe that Antia could have called up the army and sent them down there? Um, 
I suppose what I'm getting at, like I, I think she's got a right to criticise to a point. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what the trespass notice actually achieves at all. Um, if anyone would like to fill me in on that. Uh, perhaps I'm uh, uh, Simon, I'm probably the best person at this stage to answer that. The, the only person we as councillors employ is the chief executive. So we're not involved in the protection of staff. Uh, the chief executive has a legal obligation to protect staff. And in the circumstances, uh, he has made a decision. The question I would raise is if somebody comes in downstairs with a similar statement or makes a similar statement, uh, what would you be expecting the chief executive to do? If, if staff felt threatened, what would you expect the chief executive to do? What would we expect him to do as his employer? Yeah, well, I suppose it's um, how you take things. And I understand there's a bit of a long history there, but in terms of me looking at it from afar, it doesn't really seem... It seems like a veiled threat. It doesn't, to me, anyway. That's just kind of my opinion. And I would, yeah, I would just question what, uh, what a trespass notice achieves. Because it certainly won't achieve stopping her criticising everyone on Facebook just as these comments were posted on Facebook. So, yeah. I'm just... I, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hart. Um... Yeah, I don't, like, obviously it was before my time, but um, I sort of see it more as a management issue rather than a governance issue. So I would, you know, I would um, support, fully support Simon's um, recommendations for this, given I don't think it should have even come yeah, this far. But... Um, yeah, sorry, it was before my time, so I can't, don't really want to make any more comment other than that, really. But Councillor Martin. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thanks for the comments so far. I, I struggle with this whole report. I think it's, it's not a governance matter. Um, I think our role is to support the Chief Executive and the decision making that he makes. And if we have an issue with the decisions that the Chief Executive makes, we, we address that through a different process. Um, so I struggle to see how any other example of something like this would come before us as a council in any way, shape or form. We, we're told we can't even discuss individuals' rates, for example, let alone we're discussing the trespassing of an individual. Um, irrespective of my personal views on, on the allegations and the trespass, I, I just query whether it actually is something that we should even be considering. Well, it would accept that the, uh, through which of the, the allegation three also affects us as council lawyers. Oh. Well, I guess I'm saying... It's, it's not just a threat that might affect um, staff, it may also affect council lawyers. So is this, but is this mechanism of putting it on a public agenda um, the appropriate way to deal with something like this? Because in the past, and certainly everything we've done with, yeah, we, we, we're working on in terms of induction and training and things would suggest probably not. That's not going into the detail of the specific thing. I'm just at a high level. Is this how we want to operate in terms of if someone else does something? Are we as a group governor is going to sit down and decide whether that person should be trespassed or not. I thought the power of that sat with the chief executive uh, as the CEO of the organisation, the duties that he has towards his staff, and he weighs that up. And if we as a group of elected members have an issue with the decision making of our CE, we would take that up through a, a different process, a performance process, right? Um, that would be the appropriate avenue. Um, so I, I would support the, uh, the chief executive's decision rather than us making the decision for the chief executive. I think the, we have to be clear, and that is that the, uh, the matter was raised with the uh, ombudsman, and the ombudsman 
requested council to review to allow uh, a submission to come from Mrs. Keenan to allow it to be reviewed. That's not something the chief executive can do. It's something that council can do. And this is most unusual. However, that is what's happened. It's, uh, it's the directive here has come back through the um, through the ombudsman rather than a decision from the chief executive, who's mm. obviously had it taken as he Paul. Uh, thank you, Worship. Yes, you're right. Um, the, um, the, the directives come from the Ombudsman, and I don't think councils can abdicate responsibility for that. I fully understand the frustration behind this, and I understand that the, um, the action was that uh, the Chief Executive took to, um, um, to protect the, the staff members. And I understand all of this happened. The time, of course, is, is, is relevant because this was all at the time of the mosque terror attacks in Christchurch. I understand all that. However, Anthea was given a, um, an opportunity here to, um, to give her side in writing. And I think it's really disappointing that she is instead chosen to um, give a litany of grievances, not a not an ounce of remorse. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, however, I think it's important to keep things in perspective, and this in particular in perspective. And Anthea is irritating and a numbing numbing at times. Um, however, each council around the country has an Anthea and you have to put up with them. Um, and they hold councils to account. Um, and Yes, she can be awfully annoying and repetitive and difficult to understand at times. But in this context, she's not Timothy McVeigh. I don't think the threat was ever intended with malice or hatred. Um, and I do view that the, it's my view that that the two year trespass was disproportionate. And um, if I had a vote, I would vote for it to be lifted. Thanks, Paul. Did you make I think I largely agree with um, um, Councillor Madlib's comments. The submission that Anki has put in um, is hard to, it's incomprehensible. It's not relevant to the issues at all and certainly hasn't helped her cause. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I personally um, don't regard that the threat as a serious one, um, but I accept that it's um, when the, the, in the function of the Chief Executive to take a different view in terms of uh, his responsibility for the staff under his, uh, his control. So personally, um, I would be very happy to see the Trespass notice um, terminated. I think it's uh, run its course. But if the chief executive takes a different view, then I'm very happy to support that uh, as well. Thank you, councillors. Um, uh, chief executive, um, there's a, a mixed feeling around the table. Um, how would you feel about the uh, about the trespass notice coming to me. Um, I would like to discuss it with the executive team prior to making my own final decision on this. So rather than make a decision today, Rick, I would recommend that you allocate back to me for a final decision. Um, and, it's, and I can do that 
about coming back to council for a final resolution. Would it help if we pass the resolution expressed in council view? Oh, well, I think I've got a good gist of what the view actually is, and it is um, a mixed view. Um, so I would like to take that into consideration and come up with a what I would think would be a um, somewhere in the middle of both sides of the argument. So would councils be comfortable with uh, delegating to the chief executive who already has the delegation to do this, uh, but because of the circumstances, would they be comfortable with him uh, meeting with his exec team, uh, coming up with a final result and conveying it? Yep, that's where it sits. Would that be? Would you be comfortable with that, councillors? Yeah, I would have preferred that um, Simon, with due respect, that you'd gone to the mm -hmm. before this, before it came up, if you wanted to take their views on board, and I don't understand wanting to. I probably assumed that you had um, spoken to them. Look, I've, I've, got a, I've got a feeling of where they sit. I just want to go back and respectfully talk to them again about where, where we were landed today yeah. without making a predetermined outcome. Do you have a time, a time on that? Because I think um, certainly Anthea will be waiting to hear, as well others. So, uh, yeah, can we have a time frame? Before the thirtieth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Sam. Um, can someone uh, help construct a, a resolution in relation to that matter, please? What's the, what's the resolution? Nathan's got a resolution. Um, what was this one? Result of the oh, delegated to the chief, to the chief executive team to determine a final outcome or result. Which council will support? Which council will support. And, and convey it to Mrs. Keener. And councils. And councils before the city to adjourn. Comfortable with that, Simon? Mm -hmm. yeah. Councils, you comfortable with that resolution? Do we also need to accept the submission from Mrs. Keener? Yeah. Might receive it rather than accept it. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Yeah. Okay, so we can it. Do we do we have a mover? I can move it. I'll have a mover. We're in the second. Um Council Hart, Council Neil. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Those against? Well done. Now, unfortunately, uh, Deputy Mayor Crothers is about to leave, so we're going to yes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Much right. appreciated. Through the Chair, Your Worship, um, I have a conflict in the next agenda item as uh, Director of Destination West. So um, I think that's where we're at. Um, statement of intent. Mm -hmm. So I'll come back in shortly. I'll go and watch it live streamed in the next room. Nice. <laughs> 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 Thanks, sir. Thanks, I Councilor. thought we were at the end, but we're not. Okay. We're still Move on to the, uh, the next item, which is the statement of intent, after which we'll have a break for a couple of uh, people. Um, it's the, of course, it's on pages 40 to 61 of your agenda. And uh, Jane, good to see you, and Chris. And Chris. Hello again. How are you? Yeah, guys. Um, oh, wonderful. See, where do you put on for us? Oh, it's nice. Where's it always like this? Always like this. <laughs> um, so uh, we, have, we are presenting, um, oh, it says call the results. It's supposed to be, supposed to be this statement of intent. So um, we are presenting the, the oh, yeah, that's the wrong one. No, I think you've got it in your papers, so if yeah. you don't need the presentation, you should have it, you should have it there in your papers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you will recall we presented to you a draft statement of intent. So this is a combined um, for West Buildings, including West Roads and Destination Westland. Um, we presented a draft for you at the end of February, um, which we are required to do as a statutory requirement, seeking any feedback. We didn't really get any, so um, so there's not a lot of change from our draft statement of intent apart from taking into account the financial changes for Destination Westland that you would be you know, familiar with from the last meeting. So we have, we have altered the financials a little bit. And under the non-financial performance measures, we've added a 
under number five, um, the intention to investigate an amalgamation of the companies. Um, so we are working through that process. We want to do that reasonably thoroughly so that we don't have any unintended consequences. We said we'd have it done by June 21. We anticipate it will be done quite significantly before that, but we don't want to cut corners and cause issues later on. So we want to make sure we've got all the taxation and all the legal requirements ticked off before we do anything further in that respect. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jane. And uh, a reflection of um, the weather is actually behind you there on the screen. It's a uh, wonderful background. Yeah. Councillors, uh, we'll take the statement of intent uh, as read and open it for discussion. Councillor Davidson, what about you first? Uh, that's uh, all good. Thank you. Councillor Lee. Yeah, all the work that's put in. <laughs> we, we pass over things very quickly sometimes. It's not a reflection of we do realise how much work has gone into it. Thank you for that. And I'm supportive of everything that you've put forward. Thank you. Councillor Hutchin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I support that. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, no comments. And uh, Councillor Hart? Um, no, I fully support the, the um, statement of intent as presented. Thank you. Councillor Cogan? Yep. Great, guys. I know it's not been an easy job. Um, going through the process that you've done and the hours you've put into this, but fully support it. And Councillor Kennedy? No, uh, happy to, uh, to uh, receive that. Um, thanks very much, Joanne, and uh, for putting it together. Also, I'd just uh, like to say thank you uh, just in the short time I've been here in terms of how upfront and honest and you are in terms of answering any questions we as councillors may have regarding Western Holdings, sometimes not in the public um, portion of the meeting too. So, yeah, just thanks for that. Councillors, we have a, uh, a recommendation. Councillor Mark Moon. Councillor Neil. Yep. Councillor Davidson. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Well done. Uh, very, very great. <laughs> and I think it, uh, I think it says there's a, there's a high degree of confidence around the table in the yourself and the Western Holdings Board. We appreciate that. And, and uh, I, I get it when this discussion's going on. And uh, I can tell you it's, it's a high degree of confidence. So, Thank you very much. Um, I suggest now that we uh, we adjourn for a break. Um, Say 15 minutes, and then when we come back, was that too long? And when we come back, we'll move into uh, public excluded. So, for those that are watching the meeting at the present time, uh, it, it will be going off uh, live stream uh, very shortly. But thank you for attending. Sorry, Your Worship, do we have to close the public portion of the meeting, or how does that work? I don't know. Thank you. I've just taken advice from someone much wiser than myself. Would someone like to move that we move into confidential? Yeah, I can move that. Councillor Hartwell. Councillor Hart, those in favour? Okay. We're now in confidential and I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. And you can stop the last <laughs>